Hi, everyone. Oops, let me make sure I'm muted over here. Hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Bender, and I'm the Cinematic Arts Manager here at Oolate Arts in Miami, Florida. Thanks so much for joining us for another amazing edition of Art Films, which is co-presented by Oolite Arts and O Cinema. Um, I hope you all enjoyed watching Ai Weiwei, Yours Truly, a documentary about the illustrious Ai Weiwei, of course. Uh, in a few moments, we'll be joined by the director of this documentary, Cheryl Haynes, who will be in conversation with Ulight Arts VP of Programming, the one and only Esther Park. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Please submit all questions in the Q&A. Um, you're also welcome to submit them. Or I'm sorry, submit where you're dialing in from or keep the chat lively. Uh, we'll be checking the Q&A throughout the session and we'll make sure to go through them all at the close of the Q&A. So just know that we will get to your question and I'm sure you have a lot of them, as do I. A uh, little bit about the film's amazing director, Cheryl Haynes. Cheryl's the founding executive director of the Foresight Foundation and principal of the Haynes Gallery in San Francisco, California. She was the curator of At Large, Ai Weiwei, on Alcatraz and the driving force in securing the location for that landmark exhibition. In addition to At Large, Ai Weiwei, on Alcatraz, she has conceived of and produced several other landmark projects, including International Orange, a group exhibition at Fort Point, honoring the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge, Presidio Heights, Homeland Security, Sanctuary, and a series of large-scale site-specific works by renowned British sculptor Andy Goldsworthy, all of which were the first of their kind in a national park. She's initiated and produced residency projects with artists such as Richard Long at SF MoMA, Mark Dion at the Oakland Museum of California, and Cornelia Parker at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and has commissioned large-scale works by James Terrell and Andy Goldsworthy for the De Young Museum in San Francisco. Uh, Ai Weiwei, Yours Truly, which we all just had the pleasure of viewing, is her directorial debut. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Esther Park, who will be leading the Q&A. So please welcome Esther Park and Cheryl Haynes. Hi, everyone. Okay, this is where um, we get a crazy standing applause and everyone's just like roaring in their seats and I say, guys, guys, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> yes, Cheryl, do your, you know, kisses and everything else. So, um, well, thank you all for tuning in. We have a pretty uh, amazing participants list. I'm looking at the uh, chat, you know, shout out to Philly. We have people from Queens, New York. We got folks logging in from LA, Minneapolis. I mean, this is kind of the um, almost the added benefit of doing these virtual talks because pretty much everyone from all over the world can join us. So um, speaking of where everyone's tuning in, Cheryl, where are you right now? Well, I am in a little town called Nevada City, California. It's in the foothills of the uh, northeastern part of California. And I'm at an artist in residency that I established in 2003 um, that supported a number of the artists um, that were part of the introduction. Yeah. And so um, before, I think yesterday, we we're just discussing about, you know, what's you know, happening in, in Northern California. So you're pretty much safe. Your family is safe. I mean, 2020 has definitely been a wild, wild year so far. It truly has been. Uh, thank you for, for, for expressing that and asking. Um, it, it's been pretty challenging here. Uh, I was evacuated from my property uh, about a month ago and I do have elderly parents nearby and uh, a large community of friends. And, you know, I mean, you, you, you actually know, you know who your good neighbors and your friends are during times like this. And uh, that, that has actually been a, a, a really good discovery and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Well, the doc is amazing. I mean, um, this is, I guess, my second time watching it. And of course, I pretty much cry a lot. Um, and it is really just impactful now watching it at this very moment. Um, but you were saying you've been working on this doc for however many years, correct? 
Well, exhibition um, occupied my life during 2014 and 15. And we didn't actually really think about making a film until the exhibition was already on display. And so the, the, the film itself really came together very quickly. I would say we spent a little less than a year on it. Um, I mean, the, the film again is, is, is almost like a beautiful kind of documentation of Ai Weiwei's, you know, trajectory and his practice. But one thing that really struck me was it was also a really beautiful tribute to his father. Uh, Ai King, who obviously is a poet and a huge influence of Ai Weiwei's work. Um, you can kind of get a sense of why Ai Weiwei is who he is because of his father's history and his legacy. And I was just curious how you were raised. You know, how, I mean, was your family politically active? Were they into contemporary art? Were they, I don't know, farmers? You know, I'm just kind of curious um, your childhood and your upbringing. Well, it's interesting that you would ask that because that was one of the conversations that Weiwei and I were having. We, we met in Paris, he was having an, an exhibition there and I, I try to attend as many of his shows as I can because we have become friends over the years. And, and um, somehow we started talking about our families and he shared with me how um, important his father had, had been to him and how um, he really saw the world through his father's lens in so many ways as a young person. And, and I, had, I didn't really know about that part of his history. And then I started talking about my family and saying, you know, we were, you know, upper class, blue collar, you know, upstate New York, nothing really, you know, remarkable. But the one thing that my family always instilled in me was you are here to serve a purpose and you should always try to find a way to put back. Otherwise, mm -hmm. what are we doing here? And that has sustained me, even particularly through this moment in time. Um, yeah. Very important sentiment. And yeah, and just, yeah, how did you kind of get into, you know, curatorial work? Um, were you also a painter or artist yourself? Um, were you kind of creative? I mean, being, making a film, making a doc, obviously is a huge creative undertaking. So mm -hmm. I was curious on that. Yeah, I, I don't really consider myself an artist in any way. Um, Am I creative? It, yes, um, I, was, uh, I was a ballet dancer. I played classical piano, went to architecture school, um, very interested in, in contemporary aesthetics. Um, but the making of a film was really a result of conceptual matchmaking of ideas and moment in time and artist. And it, it, it didn't seem to me any different in a way than doing a site-specific installation. Um, it's still conceptual matchmaking. Right. Was it um, kind of weird being in front of the camera as well as behind a camera uh, during your process or not really? Or? Was, frankly, that was the worst part of it. And I actually had quite a few arguments with the rest of my production team because like, I don't want to be in this film. It's not about me. Don't you understand? And they're like, no, we don't have enough footage to you know, craft this story without you being part of it. And I think that was one of the challenges is we didn't really know we were making a film or we had no plans to actually. So that when we were the making of um, footage that you see and the studio footage was, was really all we had. Uh, there were so many things I wish we had captured if we had known. Um, we were only doing it for an on-island video that would uh, pre prepare a um, equivalent experience for visitors that maybe couldn't actually physically access some of the areas and for some online presence, of course. So there, we just had some minimal need for footage. Uh, otherwise, I think this film probably would have been quite different. Yeah, um, I mean, it's an exceptional film and I, we love the kind of the, the storyline of how you um, went to Egypt as well and kind of followed the story of these um, prisoners of conscience and how they were released. And it kind of had this really amazing arc to it that it was like part a documentary about Ai Weiwei, but it was also part a documentary about these prisoners of conscience. Um, but prior to doing this work, were you kind of aware of what was happening during that, you know, kind of these 
political prisoners and obviously what was happening in China and other countries? Or were you kind of just wanting to do more of an art installation project with Ai Weiwei? No, I think that, you know, my work as a curator is, is very specific. Uh, and it's, it's, it's place-based, certainly. Um, and one of the things I've noticed in working with someone like Weiwei is that when, when he brings these larger issues to the table, it really informs the conversation in a new way. And once we, I even just proposed the project, it was immediately apparent to me that this was an opportunity to address some societal ills and injustice um, because there's no one more articulate than he is. And so I viewed it as an opportunity, um, but I didn't approach it as a complete naive. Uh, you know, I, I have been involved with Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. I've supported their efforts for many years. Um, I have traveled extensively. Um, you know, I started a fabric collector in Java. Um, I have a lot of Tibetan friends. You know, I'm, I'm very involved in trying to understand other cultures and how we can learn from one another. Um, but not until I did this project did I realize how powerful an artist's voice can be and what an effect it could have on so many people. You know, the exhibition received a million visitors that alone is fantastic. And many of them didn't really know what to expect. They didn't understand that it would be about human rights or freedom of expression. They were going to see Al Capone. It, they had no idea who was this Ai Weiwei fellow. Mm -hmm. And there's something really magical about confronting an audience like that. And I'm, I'm not sure it got through to everybody. I'm not, you know, I'm not very good naive, but I think it, it did have people really thinking about some of these issues in some cases for the first time in their lives. Yeah. Um, I mean, the fact that you guys were able to do this production in Alcatraz of all places, I, I, did it just like come in a vision, Cheryl? Like, how did you just say, we're going to do this installation in, you know, one of the most iconic prisons in U.S. history? I mean, I'm, I can't only imagine the various emails exchanges that were going on about trying to make this a reality. Well, it certainly um, continues to be the most challenging project of my life today. There's no doubt about that. Um, but the, the inspiration is one thing and then actually realizing it was quite another. And what, what the realization is kind of one of my favorite parts of the story because it seems so effortless at the time. Um, I was standing on the roof of a Civil War period fort, Fort Point, which is underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And we were doing a project there, as, you, as was mentioned earlier, for the 75th anniversary of the building of the Golden Gate Bridge. And I remember looking across the bay and seeing, as indicated in the film, I mean, it was really that simple. I saw this prison and I thought, you know, that is such an iconic place. And there are so many contemporary social issues that need to be addressed here. Um, I really want to do something there. And I thought, oh, you're being very grandiose. Forget about it. That's, that's insane. They'll never let you do it. And, and then some, I think it was like about a year and a half later when I was in Beijing visiting Weiwei, he had just been released. It wasn't until that moment that I thought about it again. It had completely left my mind. And then I realized wow. the only artist in the world that could do this project is Ai Weiwei. Absolutely. And he got it instantly. Yeah. And then we were just off to the races. That, so from kind of that point to conceptualizing to the execution, how long did that take? It was less than a year. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Wow. So pretty much it was destined that this was going to happen. It's amazing. Yeah, it's just one of those things like when, when, when you come up with the idea, you just know it's the right one and, and that people will, will fall into place and you'll be able to make it work. And, you know, I'm so proud of so many people that participated on every level, whether it was the donors that were putting, you know, their funds into this project or the volunteers that spent endless hours making Lego portraits or the National Park. I mean, Frank Dean, who was the, the superintendent at the, at the time, 
was such a visionary. I mean, it's one of the things that people don't realize about the national parks is they are the most creative and visionary branch of our U.S. government. And mm -hmm. he immediately went, he's like, you know, we got, we, I think we have to go to the State Department on this one. And he literally got State Department approval in 48 hours, like right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> What? <laughs> it's been That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, um, I'm just also curious how your friendship uh, started with Ai Weiwei. Um, he's definitely one of those figures in the contemporary art world and now pop culture. Um, you know, folks have crazy stories. You know, yeah. So how? You know, when did you meet Ai Weiwei? It was like through kind of a you know, passing or, you know, I'm just so curious. Well, I, I met him in 2007, um, actually, when I went to China to investigate the contemporary art scene. And I had a friend who was a curator there and she said, you know, a gallerist like you should go because you're not interested in the commerce so much. You're really interested in the artist's practice and really understanding what motivates them. And you know, you're a different kind of um, you know gallerist in a way. So you should go and meet these people because they're just start their work is starting to emerge on the global stage, and they, they need some advice. It was a very formative moment. So I remember going to I think 40 studios in a period of like two weeks, and all through introductions, it was fantastic. Wow. Uh, but Weiwei and a couple of other artists were so impressive to me. I mean, I remember sitting down with him and just talking to him about what mattered in his life and what his work was about and how it related to you know, this moment in time. And he was so sage and quiet and reflective, and, but, but strong. And I thought, this man really has something like I've never seen before. There's mm -hmm. someone very special here. So I kept going back and going back. And then finally he said, you know, you have a lot of tenacity. All right, let's work together. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, we actually have an early question um, from Steve Colin. Why did the Chinese government allow this production? Interesting question. Did they know that you were doing the show or? They, no. didn't, they didn't know. I mean, we, we went to great lengths actually to make sure they did not and mm -hmm. you know like basically we would have meetings about sensitive subjects that were contained in the exhibition outside the complex so that we weren't videotaped or listened to right. we would go to a crowded restaurant we would walk in the park um there were various things like tibet we couldn't use the word tibet and it, you know that part of part of the work is very present i mean it's in six of the pieces um, so we had sort of code work, you know, when I went there with um, plastic Lego, which is illegal to import into China, I had to go at one point with like seven bright purple suitcases filled with Lego. And I thought, if I get arrested, this is going to be crazy. So I yeah, went, what would customs say? <laughs> well, I was, I even like created a false resume as an artist. And if I thought if I was stopped, I was, I was going to Beijing to pay homage to the bird's nest by making a model of it out of Lego, but I had to do it in front of the bird's nest. So that was, that was my total MO. Fortunately, they didn't stop me. I don't know why they didn't. I had so many giant purple suitcases. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Oh my God, you're like Jason Bourne but <laughs> for, for art world. Uh, did you ever feel like you were in danger at all while you were over there or working with Ai Weiwei or? Yeah, only once, actually. There was one trip that wasn't terribly comfortable, and um, I basically was was swooped out of a meeting and put in a car and sent back to my hotel. And it was the day that his his wife was detained for questioning, um, and then some information was swiped from my computer. Um, and yeah, it, it it was a difficult trip, but yeah, the rest of the time, no, I I felt fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I had to ask this question mainly, you know, with what's happening uh, recently with Trump, you know, uh, banning TikTok and WeChat and kind of this, um, you know, China versus America and this idea of censorship and uh, freedom of speech and, you know, a big portion of obviously these pol uh, prisoners of conscience is about freedom of speech. Um, now, with our country being so divided 
uh, for, you know, whether it's fake news or real news or, you know, QAnon or, you know, it's just been a crazy kind of moment. You know, what's your take on kind of big media um, almost censoring tweets or censoring Facebook posts? And do you feel like it's kind of like a downward spiral um, for democracy or do you feel like it's needed for now, particularly with elections coming? And I wonder what Ai Weiwei would say about that as well, but. Well, I think that he he certainly uh, would have, uh, by and large, a, a very critical view of that kind of behavior um, based on his his experience. But I can't speak for him. Um, he's one of those artists that, as soon as you think you understand them and you know them and you could speak for them, you know you really can't. Right. <laughs> so I won't even try. And from my perspective. Oh, I don't know. It's such a complicated moment in time. I, I'm not even sure how to answer that question. All I know is that, you know, working with artists is is such a great gift because particularly the most articulate ones that I have access to because they don't tell us what to think. They don't lead us. They, they, they teach us how to ask questions. And I think that's the most important thing about this moment in time is we can't whether it's somebody censoring or it's somebody just saying something crazy out there that you can't believe they would even post it's sort of almost not about that it's about you have to learn how to trust yourself and your instincts and you have to continually question whatever information is put in front of you mm. That's a, that's a great advice. Um, we have a question from Kaylin James. Hi, Kaylin. Um, did you imagine that the work would bolster such joy and pride for the detainees who received the postcards? Describe how that made you feel. Talk about crying. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, every time yeah. we received any kind of communication and you know, we did hear from people that were not included in this film um, by Facebook posts or, or letters that were sent through friends or uh, phone calls that would just appear like mysteriously from, you know, on the voice machine at the, at the office saying, these things got through and thank you. It's, it's just changing our lives. We're just so grateful that somebody knows that we're alive and that we deserve, you know, to be free. Yeah, it's amazing. Do you still keep in touch with um, these uh, released um, folks? And are, do you have like a continuing relationship with them? Or, you know, how's, how's that been from this, you know, from this film? Well, I am, I'm in pretty close touch with a few, uh, Akbad Mahir in Cairo. He's gone through a very, very difficult time since the film was, was made. Um, his mother did uh, end up passing away from cancer and and mm -hmm. his brother was detained not too long after I was there filming and uh, oh, wow and then he also was taken in for questioning a few few times um, he is such a lovely thoughtful generous man I just have nothing but so much admiration for him um, I'm also in touch with John Kiriakou quite a bit mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard a lot from Chelsea. I, I, I'm not sure. I think she's just kind of maybe low a bit and just trying to reassess sort of what, where she wants to be in this yeah. conversation. Um, some of the others have been afraid, I think, because the film has gotten quite a bit of uh, notice and um, attention. So they may be a little concerned about that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I'm um, kind of dovetailing on that. There's a question here that says, was there clearly a cause effect relation between the film and the released prisoners? Were you able to kind of measure that at all or? I would love to yeah. say that yes, but no, I think, I think right. you know, some of them had just served their sentences. Um, no, I don't think there's any way that that could have, because we've had a fairly limited release. You know, we, we, we did the, the film festival circuit. I think there were 25 festivals, something like that. And then now we're streaming on online cinemas in about 90 uh, theaters, but we're just, we haven't even had our global release yet. That, that's just in the US. So a lot of these people probably wouldn't be thinking about the film. Um, we have a question here by Ann Grauer. Um, this global project has such deep insight into the human condition. 
how did your personal journey change, shift, and grow? What was the biggest inflection point for you personally? Well, I have to say that every project I've done since then, this has had a human rights component to it. I mean, I've always been aware personally of these abuses around the world, but it wasn't until at large that I was able to bring together my personal philosophy and belief system and my curatorial activities together. It's been huge. Like my mm -hmm. project, for example, is a very large scale mural commissioning a group of international artists around climate change. And so I've, I've made kind of a personal commitment that I, I really won't do any large scale projects that don't have some social impact. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Tony Phillips has a question. He said, I admire the film a lot. That said, there's a lot of you in it, which sort of breaks the first rule of documentary filmmaking. Um, he's wondering if you ever conceived of the more traditional structure and what would have that look like? Well, like I said earlier, that's, that's sort of the one area of the film I'm most uncomfortable with, and I fought it tooth and nail. I really didn't want to be in the film at all. That was not my intention. And, uh, you know, I have been criticized a bit for it, and I was pretty strong armed into doing it, um, primarily because we didn't have any other footage. You know, we didn't mm. have, you know, we weren't setting out to make a film, and we just had to pick carefully, you know, sequences that we were making for the online interpretive video and try to stitch them together. And then, mm -hmm. you know, once I was in it, that I, that kind of had to stay in it. And but I agree with you. <laughs> it's not great. Is this, um, has this opened a whole window for you to be um, kind of a filmmaking world for you? Maybe interested in doing more docs or, or just sticking more for the traditional curatorial work? Well, you know, there again, I just kind of look at each project as relating to the, to the, to the next and whether it's film or whether it's a site specific installation or it's a sound work or it's a book I'm writing. I mean, they're kind of all the same to me. Um, I am working on two, two more films um, and, and a large scale public art project. Um, the next film that, that's of great interest to me is an artist, Mike Henderson. Um, um, he's a black artist. I've been representing in the gallery for 30 years. He was the first uh, student of color at the San Francisco Art Institute in the 60s. He worked with the Black Panthers. He's an amazing blues musician and experimental filmmaker. And he's just somebody I love as much as anyone I know in life. So he and I are working on a film together. And we, we have been for about four years now. Um, oh, wow. so I've tried to put some more juice behind it because none of us are getting any younger and these things take too long. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also have a, a, a fun question here. Is there a place where the postcard addresses are still available? Are we able to write uh, to those featured in your film? Uh, no, not, not readily. If you want mm -hmm. to contact Human Rights Watch and if there's a particular prisoner that you're interested in their status, because even since the film was released, that closing sequence has changed and there are additional people that have been released. Mm -hmm. So it, you can, if it brings you joy to write to them, I would do it, but I would call Human Rights Watch first and just see if they're still incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Um, another question here, have any of the highlighted activists from different countries made contact with each other as a result of this project? Not that I'm aware of. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, is yours truly traveling, if so, to South Florida anytime soon? <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. I guess now with COVID, nothing's traveling, but maybe uh, in the future, do you know, or? You mean, you mean at large, the exhibition or yours truly, the postcard piece? I, no, they weren't specific, but I'm assuming they meant probably the exhibition. Uh, if that's something that is a traveling exhibition or if it was that one time event. No, it was, it was conceived as a site specific exhibition. Um, so it wouldn't have the same resonance anyplace else. 
Um, and some of the work, actually the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, DC acquired Trace, uh, the, the piece of the, the Lego portraits, which is fantastic. And they have been loaning it for exhibition. And I, it was in Chicago not long ago. Uh, I'm not sure where else it's going, but, uh, and the Yours Truly postcard, the physicality of it uh, is back at the artist studio. Oh, okay. Um, what else? Oh, so, well, Lilia Garcia. Hi, Lilia. Um, she asks, um, what's next for you and will you bring this exhibition to other countries? But you already answered that. Um, what else is here? Yeah, did you kind of um, immerse yourself with Amnesty International during this whole process? And, um, you know, knowing what they're doing now, I believe that they actually did a big call out for a release of, I believe, 180 um, prisoners for COVID, um, obviously. Is that something that you've kind of kept in touch with? Obviously, you had the former executive director on the dock, and they were such an integral part in, in this film. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've been in touch lightly, uh, offering them the film, you know, to show to their supporters and friends. Um, you know, we've offered to participate in some fundraising events on their behalf. But in terms of really looking at closely at um, their, their current position of releasing prisoners around COVID, no. Um, the, pro the problem with a tiny little organization, you know, I have, it's myself and two other staff members and that's it. And we hire independent contractors and you know specialists when we gear up for projects, but we are the smallest team <laughs> you can imagine. So we really can only manage one project at a time. Um, another question here, what was your favorite part of working on the at-large installation? And they said, thank you for making this moving film. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. Um, you know, there were a lot of parts of it. They were incredibly, I don't know, favorite, enriching, uh, heartwarming. Um, I think one of the things that, and, and th this hair has something to do with it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, tell us about the hair. Yeah. You know about the hair. <laughs> well, I, this was not a fashion statement for me, and it still isn't. Uh, I basically got this hair for the at-large project because I knew very clearly that this was going to be the hardest thing I would do probably in my life. And I wanted to do something to buoy up my spirits and make me feel, excuse the expression, if there are any children watching, badass. So, and it, you know, Wei Wei never understood it. He was always like, why is your hair like that? <laughs> it was so funny. But I did it because I, it, it just sort of, it, it, I don't know, it just gave me a sense of the power that I needed to pull this off. And then when we had the installation and the exhibition on Island, it really ended up being fantastic because, because I was in the interpretive video, people knew that I was the curator and they would approach me and they would come over and they would ask me questions about, you know, this one little girl walked up to me and she said, are you a friend of Ai Weiwei's? Yes. And I'm like, yeah, we are. And she just wanted to sit down and talk to me about him. And, why he was choosing these people and she must have been six wow. so people would come up to me i mean i was out on island a lot we had we had 50 docents out there um but you know i was always try there to just kind of check visitor response and you know make sure that there weren't any issues whatever and people would come up to me constantly and either thank me or like want to cry with me or Occasionally I would get like, what is this all about? You know, but not very often. People were yeah. generally very generous and supportive and thankful. Um, so I would say talking to the people on the island, talking mm -hmm. to children, giving tours, um, giving Hillary Clinton a private tour of the project oh. for- No big deal. <laughs> three hours. Whoa. That's awesome. That was amazing. It was, and we had a little dinner out there and everything. And um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of moments that were very yeah. special. Or going yeah. to Mahir's home in Cairo was a very difficult thing to get there. And just being there with him and his beautiful children and yeah. watching him make that Lego portrait. I'll never forget that as long as I live. 
Oh yeah, that was a tearjerker moment um, when they were essentially piecing the face of their father uh, using the Lego. Do you feel like these children had any idea of the weight of what their father was able to do or probably not, but at least they have this amazing film that they could watch when they're older, but. Not the daughter, the son was very special. Um, mm -hmm. I could, even though he didn't have much English and the translator I had was terrible. He was basically <laughs> a bodyguard who was trying to translate, it didn't work well. Uh, but he, I could tell the way he was talking to him that he was getting that this was something really important and very special for his father. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're gonna have a couple more last minute questions. Um, let's see what else we got here. Lots of great, amazing tearjerker moments. So mm -hmm. these are all good. Uh, we have a question here. What artistic and operational compromises needed to be met in order to articulate Ai Weiwei's vision of freedom during our current radicalized political climate? Ooh, Nick, that is a pretty heavy question. Uh, I don't quite understand. There's a change of tense there. So what changes? What artis yeah, what artistic and operational compromises needed to be met in order to articulate Ai Weiwei's vision, I guess that's. Okay, um, you know, not a lot. The park was great. They were like, this is an important conversation. We need to go for this. Yeah, the bird nesting and hand carrying stuff and a little bit of a, you know, wobble about having Edward Snowden in the book because, mm. you know, the park service had their, you know, stamp on it and a few other little things, but by and large, they were just like, they didn't even know what we were gonna do. I mean, normally you go through this incredibly rigorous compliance process, which I'm doing right now on this Seawell project. And they were just like, we trust you. I'm like, really? Awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was the hair. It must have been the hair. <laughs> I got some great photos with me in the hair with the National Park Service hat on. I'll tell you, those will be treasured for the rest of my life, too. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, another question here. Will Ai Weiwei remain in the U.S., and does he feel the U.S. population support his artistry effectively? Well, he lives in England, oh, um, England. and his studio is in Germany. And uh, I th he's been spending a lot of time uh, in uh, Portugal. Oh wow! And he comes to he comes to the he hasn't been coming since COVID though. Uh, he had thought about moving to California before all the fires started happening, and we were mm -hmm. looking at building together near my foundation, but uh, that didn't happen. And I'm actually glad it didn't. Yeah, it would have been right for him to be here. It's too unnerving. Uh, one last question, which is a very unique question. Um, what's a flower that was placed on the ground at the end of the film left there? Hmm. Um, only for the I film. think the porcelain, yeah, the porcelain yeah. flower that was left. It was the question is, was it left there? Yes, was it left there? No. No. It was not. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it kind of ends in this kind of bold statement from Ai Weiwei, you know, that says, do one small thing every day to prove the existence of justice. And I wanted to ask you, what small thing do you do every day to prove the existence of justice? Oh, probably there's more than one small thing. Um, I think it's, it's supporting creative vision it's working for inclusion and equality in whatever I do. Um, it's being kind to others, uh, however I can be. Um, yeah, I don't know, whether, uh, beyond that, I don't know what any of us can do. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, any kind of last parting words? I feel like, you know, the film was both super heavy, but at the same time, ex extremely hopeful and inspiring. And 
you were just saying how this film just keeps giving like it's one of those things that has a life of its own and people are you know learning more about it and of course pe more people are learning about Ai Weiwei and you know you as a curator and obviously now a filmmaker um we'd love to kind of hear your last thoughts on the time this moment that we're in because yeah boy it's a crazy time we're living in it is i think you know i think it really boils down to each of us as individuals and being the best person we can be and yes are we is it important to be aware of the forces around us to to vote appropriately to encourage others to do so absolutely but i think the most powerful thing we can do is just be just be good people mm -hmm. and be open to our differences but more importantly our similarities because at the end of the day we all want the same things for ourselves and our family we want good health we want access to education and health care. And I just want to be happy. Amen. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. That was a great ending of, you know, this amazing film and obviously your time here. Um, one of the things that too for our audiences will kind of uh, circulate some, you know, um, some handouts. I know some people wanted to know if there was a page of listing all of the activists that were featured in the exhibit. So we could maybe get that from Cheryl. So I'm sure everyone's kind of eager to learn more about at large and of course how they can get involved. So um, please stay tuned. We'll shoot you that email. But um, Cheryl, thank you so much. Oh, what is that? Look at this cool. book, it's so gorgeous. It's backwards, I realize, but Chronicle Books made this book and it is, <laughs> I love this book so much, it's really beautiful. So if you wanna know more about the project and the exhibition, that's your document. Love it, love it. Well, thank you all so much, everyone that tuned in from all over, wherever you are. Um, send all of us uh, love and as Cheryl say, um, let's just be happy, right? and be good people. So thank you guys. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you all of you guys for joining. Good night.